21, I just finished the final exams of my history degree and I went to the library one day and accidentally picked up this book. It's brilliant. I remember reading it in one afternoon and it's called Robert Smithson and the Elizabethan Country House. The book rediscovers the work of Smithson and his son who were mason designers. This is before the professional architect arrives. They were shadowy, forgotten figures, but they were responsible for the greatest houses of the Elizabethan age. The book builds up slowly to a huge climax, which is set on a windy hilltop in Derbyshire. The last chapter is all about this place, Bolsover Castle. It was designed by the Smithsons in 1612 for the Cavendish family, one of the great aristocratic dynasties in the north of England. The castle makes an incredibly dramatic sight in its rather incongruous spot above the town of Bolsover, the place where the miners' strike started in the 1980s. It's a completely unexpected place to find a fairy tale castle, which for me makes it all the more magical. I stumbled upon this place by picking up a random library book, but it became very important to me. Not only as an architectural masterpiece, but as the perfect example of a building that captures the spirit of its times. By the 1630s, the castle had become the pleasure palace of a playboy cavalier, William Cavendish and his very distinctive personality comes over in every quirky detail of the masonry and decoration. It's William's story that I want to tell and to show how his very eccentric castle captures some of the tensions in 17th century England that would eventually lead the nation to bloody civil war. The book that made such a deep impression upon me was by Marc Girouard. He's an architectural historian who pioneered the idea that the inhabitants of a building are just as important as its designers. He taught us how buildings can tell stories about the past. Here's Marc Girouard casting his spell. By an unlikely miracle, the keep at Bolsover has survived as an almost untouched expression in stone of the lost world of Elizabethan chivalry and romances. Well, by another unlikely miracle, I managed to get a job here in my 20s working for English Heritage. I spent six years of my life here, which I love, and I got sucked into the crazy world of the man who built Bolsover Castle. William Cavendish, Duke of Newcastle. He was the ultimate cavalier at the court of Charles I. The castle William builds is full of secrets and hidden meanings. You can read it in all sorts of different ways. But I'm going to draw out one story because I believe William built this castle as a gamble, as a roll of the dice, as an attempt to impress the king. but we need to go back further. It was actually William's father, Sir Charles Cavendish, who first began building the castle on this site in 1612. Sir Charles came from an eminent Northern family. His mother was the most important person in Elizabethan Derbyshire. She was Bess of Hardwick, builder of Hardwick Hall, the amazing building. It's just over there. You can see it on a sunny day. Bess had climbed the ladder to power and riches by getting married four times. As the poem goes, four times the bridal bed she warmed and each time so well performed that when death spoiled each husband's billing, he left the widow every shilling. Her third son, Charles, wanted to compete with Bess on the housing front. So he acquired the ruins of a Norman keep just here. Now, Bolsover isn't grand like Hardwick. It's quirky and eccentric and a bit offbeat, and to my mind, all the better for it.
William's father, Sir Charles Cavendish, was a truly talented amateur architect. And this is a very exciting moment in the history of architecture because it's going from being a mechanical art, as learnt by the medieval master mason on the job, to being a liberal art, something you can learn about by reading books, something fit for gentlemen. And Charles Cavendish is one of the very first gentleman architects. Bolsover Castle was a close collaboration between Sir Charles and his masons, Robert and John Smithson, the subjects of Girouard's book. I see it as a team effort. The builders themselves played an important creative role. But Charles Cavendish was quite conservative in his tastes. The new classical buildings were starting to appear in Britain, but what he's gone for here is a gothic, chivalric, romantic recreation of the Norman keep that had been on the site. However, poor old Charles died before the castle was complete. And at 23 years old, his son William inherited it and brought about a very clear change in the direction of the project. So in 1617, our young hero, William, took over the building project and very quickly put his own stamp on the castle his father had begun. At the same time as we get the development of this new profession of architecture, we get the arrival of classicism. And we can see the tension between the old, the new, the chivalric and the classical in this building. Essentially, it's medieval in character. This is Sir Charles Cavendish's vision of the past with the battlements and the turrets and the outsized crossbow slits. Not really very practical for defence, but this is a castle for chivalry. But then if you look at the shell of the building that William inherited, he started to add the new classical detail onto it. That's why over the uh, entrance there, we've got that classical pedimented doorway. And immediately over the entrance, the classical figure of Hercules, who's essential to the whole of the hidden meaning in this building. But more on him and his significance later. Now, when William Cavendish takes over the completion of the castle with all of this classical detail, I think it's fair to say that the local craftsmen don't get it right first time. Here's an example of proper classicism. It's a garden gateway designed by Inigo Jones, top architect of the period, and built in London. Now, Inigo Jones understands the secret of classicism. It's the mathematical relationship between the horizontal and the vertical. It's sometimes called the golden section. It's the harmony of parts. Everything has to be carefully measured and in proportion. You can see that here in Jones's design. William Cavendish decided that he wanted a gateway just like this, and he sent his surveyor, John Smithson, to go and make a drawing of it. Unfortunately, though, Smithson didn't realise he had to measure. And what he's produced is a rather crude, naive copy of Jones's elegant design, lacking proper classical proportions. The result is that when the gateway appeared on the building at Bolsover, it was a slightly bodgy version of the original. <laughs> Bolsover Castle then was a place for architectural experimentation. It's important to realise that it wasn't the main family home of this branch of the Cavendishes. That was seven miles away at Welbeck Abbey in Sherwood Forest. This former monastery was the economic centre of their estates. It's where their business got done. Bolsover, on the other hand, was a holiday house, a pleasure palace, if you like. It was described in a poem as being like a pearl, like a pendant in the ear. It was a place where the more exotic side of William Cavendish's character would reveal itself. William was a typical cavalier. He was a charming, witty and handsome figure, a writer of bawdy poetry with a passion for the finer things in life. He was obsessed with pleasure of all kinds, but that wasn't quite enough for him. 
William longed to be taken more seriously at court, but he had a bit of an image problem. People said he spent too much of his time dabbling with the art of architecture or with his lady friends. But William was ambitious. He wanted to be made master of the horse, an important post in the royal household. And he was uniquely equipped for this. He was the best horseman in the country. The master of the horse was in charge of the royal stables and of all the transport arrangements for the court. It was a politically important position, close to the king and commanding power and respect. <laughs> With typical exuberance, William built a grand riding house in a range of the building dedicated entirely to horses. If I were to say the words to you, the Cavaliers, you'd probably think of gentlemen with long curly hair and lacy collars and a kind of arrogant attitude. But actually, they take their name from the very technical art of horsemanship, the art of the Cavaliero. This isn't just riding horses for hunting or for the battlefield. It's teaching horses how to dance, how to perform these astonishing moves of an aerial ballet, the airs above the ground, they're called. Here's William Cavendish performing the capriole when the horse literally leaps up into the air. They need immense strength to do this and daily training. If you were a real expert horseman like William Cavendish was, you would have done it every single day. If it was raining outside, then you would have constructed for yourself one of these buildings. It's a lost building type, the Riding House. Noblemen had them in the 1630s up and down the country. This is the only substantial survival here at Bolsover Castle. The features are a soft sandy floor for the horse's hooves. The windows are high up. You can see that so the horse can't look outside and get distracted. You need a big door to the outside and ideally a viewing gallery because you invite all of your friends to come and see the daily training. William Cavendish here at Bolsover would have been in the riding house every day doing this kind of thing, taking the horses through their exercises, round and round these tall posts placed in the middle there. William Cavendish learnt how to ride at the Royal Muse. He shared his riding lessons with King Charles I himself. And the king was really good at this. And it's important, actually, for a prince or a king to be able to do this because it's symbolic. The rider in control of the horse is like a person in control of their passions, somebody who's in charge, somebody who's able to present a sort of dignified face to the world. So being good at riding is actually a really important part of being a good king. William did have a reputation as a dilettante, as somebody who was very frivolous, who wasn't serious. But actually, when he was in the riding house, he was deadly serious. William's talent as a horseman was undisputed, but he needed to sway King Charles I. He'd make his bid in the best way he knew how. The castle would provide the stage for a mask, a scripted theatrical party. It would form the climax to a sumptuous weekend of feasting, music and dancing. William commissioned the celebrated playwright Ben Johnson to write the mask that would be dedicated to the King and Queen. His plan was to charm his royal guests into giving him the prized position of Master of the Horse. While this may have seemed like a great idea, it was also a tremendous gamble. Politically, this was a time of growing puritanical zeal, building up against the decadence and indulgence of the ruling classes, sowing the seeds for the coming civil war. And on a more practical and personal level, it would cost William a small fortune to put it on. He couldn't afford for anything to go wrong. 
So imagine the scene. It's the 30th of July, 1634. That must have been the most exciting day in the whole history of Bolsover Castle, the day that the king and queen came to visit. Here would have been William Cavendish to welcome them. Now, I think that he brought the whole castle and gardens and paintings and everything to perfection for this day to make a very particular point to the king and queen. This is the house of Hercules. There he is positioned right over the entrance. In mythology, Hercules did something very, very bad. He accidentally killed his wife and children. But then he performed his nine heroic labors in order to redeem himself, to get himself back to the straight and narrow. And he was able to do this because he had the special qualities and abilities of a hero. In mythology, you often see Hercules resting in the garden of pleasure because he doesn't need to keep plugging away up the difficult hill of virtue because he has these special characteristics. You can see the relevance to William Cavendish. By saying, I live in a house of Hercules, he's saying, I am Hercules. I'm entitled to enjoy myself, to indulge myself in pleasure because I also have inner virtue. So that's the sort of scenario which I think he's presenting to the king and queen as he welcomes them and takes them into his castle. The furniture has long since disappeared, but the revealing paintings decorating the walls remain. You can see how this concept of William Cavendish as Hercules might begin to work if you imagine him bringing the king and queen on a tour. They've entered underneath that statue of Hercules over the entrance, performing one of his nine heroic labours. He'd temporarily taken over Atlas's job of holding up the globe. And here, in the Great Hall, Hercules is performing a whole lot more of his labours, which mainly involve killing or subduing violent wild animals. My favourite picture is that one, where he's dealing with a man-eating mare. He's about to club it. And this is most appropriate for a horseman like William Cavendish was. This room's called the Pillar Parlour for obvious reasons, and it's one of the masterpieces of Bolsover Castle. There's so much going on in here. The ceiling bosses have got winged horses, more love of equestrianism. And also we've got that clash between the cosmopolitan and the local. The design of the panelling is copied from one of the royal palaces, the Palace of Tybalt, and yet the black paint comes from local black coal dust. Even in the 17th century, mining was going on in this area. The paintings in here describe the five senses. We've got sight and smell and taste and sound and touch, and all of these came into their own during the mask on the royal visit. The king and queen in this room were invited to take part in a banquet of the senses. So a song was sung about the five senses, and they were given a banquet to eat. And by a banquet, I don't mean a sort of meat feast. I mean a special pudding course with special wines and sweetmeats and desserts. And during this, perfume was burnt so they could smell a lovely smell and they could touch a velvety carpet on the table. The whole thing for the king and queen was a banquet of the senses. Downstairs we experience bodily pleasures, but up here we're in the elevated world of the heavens with the stars on the ceiling. And here we've got religious symbolism. We've got saints on the walls and figures from the Bible. The fireplace in here is particularly miraculous with the beautiful marbles. 
and it also shows that clash between the old and the new. This fireplace combines the Gothic pointed arch in the middle here with the new classical columns holding the whole thing up. Once again, William is personified in his castle. Here he is in the corner of the room alongside his brother, amongst all the saints aligning himself with their virtue. Another hint to the king that he'd be a good man to have around. And finally, we come into the bedchamber. Now, you might think it's a bit odd to invite the king and queen into your bedroom. But the point of the day is this, the house is theirs. Of course, they should have access to all parts of it. This room forms the climax of the tour. And here, Hercules' choice between virtue and pleasure is laid out in architectural terms. I believe that here, the king and queen were invited to turn left or right into one or the other of these two little closets, private rooms for solitude and contemplation. And this one represents virtue. So this first closet is the closet called heaven. It represents virtue. It's incredibly richly decorated with these gold Chinese oriental type scenes. And the walls are set with cupboards so you could store your musical instruments or your books in here. But the main thing is the ceiling. Look at it, it's incredible. This is a ceiling all about religion and virtue. There are the symbols of the passion the baby angels are all crying because Jesus has just been crucified. But right up on the ceiling, there he is going off to heaven. It's quite an unusual depiction of Jesus. There's a William Cavendish twist going on here because Jesus is shown enjoying himself. He's dancing. <laughs> The other closet was about the Christian version of the afterlife. This one is a complete contrast. Here we've got the classical version of the same thing, the gods and goddesses of Mount Olympus. And they're enjoying themselves. Basically, they're having an orgy. This closet is always known as Elysium. Here's a footnote. In the 19th century, the castle became used as the local vicarage. And when the vicar was taking guided tours around, he didn't call this the Elysian Closet. He referred to it as hell. Now, the king and queen would have been invited to choose between virtue and pleasure. But I think I know which was William Cavendish's favourite. This closet seems a lot more personal to me. This is where Hercules himself has ended up sitting in the corner. And over the window there, there's a very intimate little motto. It says, all is but vanity. As if William Cavendish is saying, well, I may be a duke, I may be the owner of this fabulous castle, but in this little private room, I'm just a human being. The other reason that I think that this is the more important closet, that pleasure is more important than virtue, is that this is the closet with the view, and it looks right down on the goddess of love in that garden of pleasure below. It's a fountain that's all about love of different kinds. On top is the goddess of love, Venus. She's surrounded by her little naked urinating boys protecting her. And around the outside, she's being attacked by these leering, lascivious men in white in the niches, and also by the so-called priapic beasts of Bolsover. And they are pretty X-rated. The Venus statue is based on a slender, elegantly turning classical figure. Although here, like the gateway, we get the Derbyshire version. She's been transformed into a more solid local lass. And if she were to stand upright, we'd see that one leg is longer than the other. But rather than sneer at the dumpy Bolsover Venus, I think that we should celebrate her as an example of British classicism. She's bold and characterful, and she makes us smile. 
This is a fountain for a man who definitely places pleasure over virtue. After the tour was over, the castle proved the perfect setting for putting on Ben Jonson's theatrical event, Love's Welcome, to amuse and impress King Charles I. Different historians have their own interpretations about where the mask might actually have been performed, but it does contain the stage direction in a garden like this. So I think that we can imagine all the courtiers up there around the top of the wall walk with the actors and the scenery and the musicians down here. This painting shows the king and queen as a mask, dressed as Apollo and Diana. They're seated on a mechanical floating cloud and the Bolsover production had one too. It was also a little bit risque. Johnson's script poked fun at short people a bold move when both the king and William himself were not terribly tall. So what did the king and queen make of all of this? They must have had some sort of discussion about the relative merits of pleasure and virtue. Did King Charles say, well, William Cavendish, you're a cheeky chappy, but I like the cut of your jib? Or did he find all this kind of excess rather distasteful? Was he going to give William Cavendish the job? Was the whole thing going to work? Well, no, it didn't. And in many ways, William's mask was a massive miscalculation. The choice of Ben Johnson as author was poor. Johnson was out of favour at court. William had misjudged the character of the king as well. Charles was a cold and cerebral man. He wasn't interested in debauchery. And finally, times were a-changing. The Puritan party was growing in strength. The luxury at the court was becoming increasingly unpopular. The last word on William's great party would be that of the judgmental Earl of Clarendon. He said, yes, it was a stupendous entertainment, but God be thanked, no man ever imitated it. And William would never get the job of master of the horse. He was left severely out of pocket and with his reputation tainted, the party was definitely over. William Cavendish would have wanted us to remember him as a great poet and a great courtier. We don't. But I don't think that his life was wasted, because we can still enjoy the incredibly evocative ruins of his house. It's an outrageous, idiosyncratic castle that captures the cavalier spirit of its creator. And for me, this will always be the place where I found my vocation through an accidental encounter with a book when I was just 21. You're Dead to Me is the history podcast for people who don't like history and those who do. Join Greg Jenner to learn and laugh. Listen via BBC Sounds.